go straight into this. We're ready to go. Yeah, we're ready to go. Rock and roll. Okay. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, sort of a personal project it's called Federated SIP, um, and kind of generally uh, open SIP's and RTP engine integration uh, with a lot of the 2.1 slash 2.0. X master branch features. So we'll cover whatever you guys have the most interest in after we get through the, the basics. So first of all, who are you people? Well, who am I? Uh, I'm Eric Tammy. I work at Onsip. I'm the principal engineer there. Um, Onsip does hosted PDX service as well as uh, SIP platform service for developers. Uh, we also are developers of SIPJS, which is a JavaScript signaling library uh, for WebSockets and also with newly implemented Support, but that's star star experimental. <laughs> uh, you can check that out at subjs.com uh, or on GitHub. We've got lots of examples there. So, quickly, uh, what we're going to be doing here today is going through and actually setting up uh, virtual machines. If you guys have DigitalOcean accounts or some other virtual machine provider where you can get a VM spun up. Uh, that has a public IP, that would be ideal. That would make it so that we can actually do some federated signaling. Um, and while that's kind of going on, we're going to be talking about federated SIP both the project and what it means to be federated in a SIP signaling perspective. As far as the project is concerned, it's made up of a couple of components, primarily the federated SIP proxy, which is open SIPs, um, and regular expression-based translations for outbound calling that allow you to do some Manipulations before you send things out, uh, and then just kind of the basics of a, a standard SIP uh, server as far as handling users, registrar, server side net handling, and then RTP engine for media relay, which gives you a lot of wins for interop. So, first things first, um, check out the actual code for the Federated SIP project. You can go to the GitHub page. I'm quickly jump over to that. And at the same time, uh, I don't know how quick your VMs are for getting spun up, but I'm going to go through the process of setting up the VM through with this presentation. So we're going to do that as well. So we can do that, and we'll clone the uh, the project over. So let's see. What distro do you want? Uh, CentOS seven or Debian eight, and one of those two only. Sorry, the installer scripts only works with that. <laughs> Drop it here. I'm going to be cheap. I tried to get DigitalOcean to sponsor this event and give everybody free droplets, but they didn't do that to me. Sorry. <laughs> two scripts uh, in the scripts directory. Uh, it's basically CentOS 7 install or maybe 8 install. Uh, and it will prompt you uh, whether or not you want to enter a domain and or a user. Don't enter anything, just hit enter, the enter key. Uh, I am going to enter something, but that's because I'm different. Uh, <laughs> it's a long 60 seconds. I'm 
And this is designed to be done on clean VM. It will likely work on one you already have set up, but I don't take any considerations to keep things tidy with these install scripts, so I would recommend you do it on a box you don't care about. <laughs> okay, so get clone. Sorry, but it's funny to me that 
you can send an email between anyone. You know, I'm Eric at ufreak.com, and I can send an email to James at But that's not how SIP seems to be implemented across the general internet. Um, and in my mind, it should be, and that's certainly what the specification was written as. Uh, and specifically, R6263, which is titled Locating SIP Servers, uh, kind of makes it pretty clear and simple, right in section four, they sum it up and say, it basically boils down to resolving DNS to get the appropriate transport protocol and IP address support for what the URI should be. So uh, that's really the bottom line. And that's what this project is focused around doing so that people can have some services work like email. I'd like to be able to call. That actually is. This is my wife's mother calling my home phone line, and it's ringing my cell phone here over SIP. <laughs> so, you know, let that ring. You sure you Unless you guys want to talk to her. I'm sorry? You sure you don't need to get that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure she doesn't want to talk to me. Um, just a general process of how locating SIP service should happen. So it's multi-steps, and there's multiple records involved. So primarily, the first thing you have to do is do a NAP or lookup, and that's going to give you at least one, oh, not always, uh, should give you uh, SRV records that indicate the transport protocols that the server's capable of doing. Uh, and then based on what capacity your server has, it's going to do an SRV lookup on at least one of those records to determine what an A record is uh, for that server, and then finally the A record to get the IP address. Um, and then the RFC does say that if there are known after records found, the client should construct SRV queries for every protocol that it supports. This is the only place where OpenSIPS does not fit exactly, and it doesn't generate multiple SRV, or sorry, multiple uh, NAFTA requests, uh, sorry, uh, multiple SRV requests for protocols. Um, but it's tricky. So, <coughs> talking about tricky, there are lots of gotchas related to doing these and lookups. If there's any port, and this is all part of the RFC uh, 3263. Uh, so they did this with the intention of making things fallback compatible. Um, and it works in most cases, but <coughs> for a lot of newer stuff, it doesn't necessarily work. So if there's any port, don't do anything. Just do an A-Record lookup. So, and a lot of clients are buggy, so they'll put ports on, and then you completely break the federated signal. Um, if there's a transport parameter, so you can transport equals TCP, that should be used, but it's not a must in the RFC. So that also was a gotcha. Um, if the host is an IP address, but there's no transport protocol specified, the RFC says that if it's a SIP URI, use UDP. Otherwise, with SIPs, use TCP. That doesn't account for things like WebSocket Secure, which could be using a SIPs URI scheme. So uh, this is the internet. Lots of clouds. Uh, so this is just an example. Uh, Acme, Borax, Kenco.com, Drills.org, Acme.net, and Federated.io, which is a domain that I did own, but I unfortunately let it go. Uh, and now it's gone forever. <laughs> uh, let's say that Bob at Borax.com is called Frank at Federated.io. So the general process would be first step, do an after lookup on Federated.io, find out what the SRVs are. So I see that we get two SRVs back for UDP and TCP because it's specified as a laser pointer, right? Yeah. Over there, uh, it has two transport protocols that it supports, whereas borax.com only does UDP and WebSocket. So while we're looking at the NAFTA records, we can kind of look a little bit more detail about what all these fields are. Uh, general stuff that is pretty similar to priorities, weights. Um, flags is the only thing that's a little bit interesting in that uh, they specify things. S is the SRV record, format A, AAA, or an absolute URI. Everybody knows what you do with an absolute URI. You know, I'm actually not certain how that works. You get a URI flag record. Um, the service type, which indicates again uh, the combination uh, transport protocol, uh, and the replacement that you're actually going to be doing on <coughs> after the fact. So these, the website ones are new. These are defined in the SIP uh, website at RFC, which I don't remember what it is. I don't know if you do change, but, but I'd be seeing look it out with those guys. Yeah. But anyway, those are what's been registered for uh, NAFTA records. 
Uh, so after it's on the SRV record lookup, or adapter record lookup, uh, it's going to go into an SRV record lookup. So it got uh, back here. So we got uh, SRVs for uh, VP and TCP because that's what Federate.io supports. However, Borax.com only does UDP and WebSockets, so it's only going to follow the UDP SRV. Uh, and it does a SRV lookup on that, and it gets back two records, uh, one for sip onefederatego and sip 2federatego uh, with different priorities. So in this case, it's just going to take the first one because uh, it's lower priority. And it does an A record lookup on sip onefederatego and sends the request out for the internet, the, the basics of it, which is what this slide says. Um, for initial requests. Uh, and that RFC 3263 specifies the same uh, host must be used throughout the transaction. You can't be doing DNS lookups in the middle of the transaction and sending stuff to the places that don't work. Responses route back via headers. Um, and that's really the, the basics of getting <coughs> initial requests routed. So that's only half the picture as far as SIP signaling is concerned, and that there are often times when you send sequential requests, like sending a buy to terminate a call. Uh, and that's why we use things like the core route and loose routing. Uh, okay. So, of the minutes on the plane, this logic is not really actually that great. Uh, I would actually probably change this to record any requests that can create a dialogue, which I think is really just invite. Right? If there's any other requests that are dialogue for me, anybody? <laughs> so, so I'll change that. Uh, if anyone is working right now on the Federate GitHub project, just submit a pull request while we're standing here and I'll, I'll fix that. So we record route any request that can create a dialogue, and that inserts route headers, and we'll look at that in a second. And then when we receive uh, sequential requests, we loose route. So this is really a mechanism for building up a complete routing picture and then conveying that back to the originator of the UAC. So, back to a real world example. So Eric at ucreek.com, which is me, wants to call Eric at junctionnetworks.com, which is also me. But I happen to have both those accounts registered when I was doing this. So I make that call, and you can see here, we get record route, record route, record route. Uh, and it's from Eric at ucreek.com to Eric at junctionnetworks.com, which is also indicated the AOR parameter. And you'll see that the buy headers all match the record routes except for the first buy, which is the actual device that sent the request. So in this case, kind of going back, quickly I guess we'll take a look at this again. So we've got record route 107, 170, 192, 145, and then dot 102, and then dot 103. So looking at this example, anybody care to hazard a guess how this call routed through this picture? We just want to tell you. Okay. So over here is Eric at ufreak.com. Sends it across the app on proxy, which is ufreak.com. It's in, inserting a record route header, which is the bottom most record route here of dot 145. The next record route is dot 102 and dot 103. So proxy 2. We're going to assume it's that one and two for this example, and then proxy three is one and three. So this call traversed three proxy servers to get to my junction networks phone. Uh, and that's the reason why record routing, record routing is important, in that even if ericbfreak.com does all the appropriate adapter, SRV, and A record lookups to get there, it's still not necessarily the terminus for where the endpoint is registered. And this is a real world example in that Judge Networks uses uh, path headers for non adjacent registrars so that Eric at junctionnetworks.com registers to proxy 3, but we distribute our registrations so that if a request is received to proxy 2, it can do a registration lookup, restore the path header, and loose route it straight out to the proxy server that's responsible for doing all the NAT handling to that user agent. Uh, so, and you'll see that's copied the complete record route set. And also, I want to actually mention quickly. So, this invite coming down is coming from 103 to the WAN IP address of where Eric at Junction Networks.com is registered. That's why it has the full route set here. 
So this is coming out of this proxy server here going down to the phone. And the 200 OK is coming back from Eric at chartnetworks.com back up to its 103 proxy server. And you can see that it's copied the entire record route, route set into the 200 OK, and that's so that the UAC, uh, the original UAC in the main request, gets the full route set. And the reason why we do that is so that when the UAC sends by, they have a complete set to put in as route headers to get the by routed. So this by is being seen by the U3.com server at 145 as it's coming in from ericu3.com to the U3 server. So my user agent has inserted, or rather copied, all the record route headers over into the route set and then we lose route. So ericu3.com or u3.com gets this request, it takes the topmost route header, if it's itself, it peels it off and sends it to the next server. And then that happens all the way down the line until it gets to the end. And then it actually routes by a URI. And up here, you can see this is kind of really funny looking URI. It's because it's a junction network response that uses Gruing to uh, <coughs> encode path information into the, the, the URI once we've received a request for it. So that's really the, the gist of it as far as federated SIP signaling is concerned. And now I thought we would kind of hope that our VMs are done installing and go back and do some stuff with those. Uh, anybody have any particular questions about any of the signal stuff so far? No? Okay. How's everyone's VM? Are they are right. running? Okay. okay. So I think the first thing that we're going to do is uh, add some regex-based translations, and we should be able to, assuming my phone is working, which we saw that it was earlier, uh, do some signaling. So if you want to go to your VMs, uh, I guess quickly, the, the way that these translations work is when a request is received, uh, before you any user location information lookups, uh, we'll try and match uh, based on a couple of criteria. Uh, regular expression on the user portion of the request URI. Uh, also, we can match against the front domain, uh, the front user, user agent, things like that, and do any different number of translations, between strip digits, prefixing, whatever, all this sort of stuff. And because you're matching based on regular expressions, there's a definite possibility that you could have multiple matches. So there's a priority so that you can have precedence uh, when there are multiple matches. So the first thing we'll do, uh, and the reason why we uh, have these a lot of times is because a lot of phones don't have the ability to type in a full AOR, uh, which is, you know, eric at workshop.ufreak.com. Uh, so in this example, uh, I'll have you guys put in this, and you should be able to dial 1000 and it will ring me, but I haven't registered my stuff yet, so don't, you, don't do it just yet. And this proxy one, two, three thing, but in whatever domain gets spit out at the end of your script, it should tell you proxy something dot uh, and that's your from domain effectively. Uh, and then everything else should be the same. So I'm going to try and get my uh, user agent registered here quickly. Turn around here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
so yeah, uh, to do this, uh, SQLite 3, and the database will appear at var db open system. Okay, so select, there should be nothing in here, so let's do dot schema translation. So, what do we here? So, I do need to that. I'll do this with you. So insert into translations ID match projects. Someone just called me. Probably oh, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> The invite comes in to 1000 at workshop.ucreek.com from Eric at workshop.ucreek.com. Uh, it does a lookup on the translations table and it gets 
these parameters and it says don't strip anything, don't prefix it, blah, blah, blah. Translate the user to user 452 and the domain to proxy 452.com. So post translation request URI is user 452 and proxy 452.com. Uh, and then the server does some uh, attempts to determine whether it's IPv6 or not. Uh, this is kind of a work in progress. So uh, it determines IPv4. Uh, and then it simply follows DNS. It, it does all the steps that we talked about. Uh, I only created an A record. Um, it's unfortunate that AWS does not actually support NAFTA records, and that's probably why I'm going to be leaving it soon. Uh, resolves the IP to, or resolves the domain to Jared's server and relay it. And his server has nothing to do with my server. It's just how it should work, just like email. Uh, and then again, we do all the report routing, things like that, so that when, uh, I don't know if we sent it to buy, it was, I think maybe I did, but, yeah. Uh, and it just routes. So that, that's that. Uh, oh, you can also see, uh, we do RTP engine stuff over here. Uh, this is just a, a basic plain RTP session, it looks like. Removing ICE, IPv4, plain RTP uh, uh, That's that. So, uh, here's another one. So, you, this is more of a real world practical example, and that uh, there are places that everybody knows that do free toll free termination because they get paid for it effectively. Uh, so we can make it so that all of our servers can make toll free calls by adding translation. Um, all right, well, I'll move back just for fun. And then, we can talk about whatever you guys really want as far as RTP engine or uh, net handling or stuff. So, say, I need from the manufacturing case, can I change this? Change the manufacturing case. Anybody work for arptel.com? So, thanks for thinking this word for the presentation.
That's just a random MCI test number, 1-800-444-444. Some old calling card system or something. But anyways, this is the translations that exactly they're supposed to do. Invite comes in. Uh, they recognize that it's a North American Army client 164 and prepend the plus I actually didn't dial the plus. Uh, and post translation, it's turned into 1 800 444 at tf.archipel.com. And again, files RC 3263, routes it out, and they answer the call. Well, turn it into PSC and answer the call. So that's that's a really powerful tool. It sounds really simple, and it is, but it's super duper handy, especially if you're a person who develops SIP signaling platforms to be able to add dynamic translations and things like that. So, um, yeah, so at this point, uh, we can take a, a look at the actual federated SIP config. If you guys have any particular interests in any areas, uh, I don't know if there's pieces that people want to hear more about or not. I was, I was curious about the way you are doing the, uh, you are querying the translation table. It's basically a prop query in the script, right? It is, yeah. And, and something I want to actually do async. I'm not sure. I guess do all ABDD queries have to async? I, mean, I don't think SQL like SQL. SQL like is not? Okay. I think the blip is everything on that. Does it? You don't have to know. Not now, for sure. I okay. think that only my stuff has. Um, and another, I have another question that's not, sure. that's probably not, uh, but have you ever considered using dial plan for, for doing this dynamic uh, translations? Uh, it's something that I've thought about, but I came across originally doing MySQL regular expression based stuff, and I like how really lightweight it is, and it's super easy to change without having to do any restarts or anything like that. To be fair, I haven't looked at the dial plan module greatly, and it could be something that would work for me, I'm not sure. Basically, well, all of those uh, queries will work. Uh -huh. uh, the only, let's say, difference that uh, that will be, I don't know, uh, probably might not be acceptable for some of the script writers, is that uh, you have to have separate rules for separate uh, actions. So uh, as I seen, you have a single rule for stripping, mm -hmm. adding prefixes, uh, uh, stripping, um, changing the headers and stuff like that. In Bell Plan Model, you should probably you would probably have a rule for each kind of action. Mm -hmm. And you will have to write different separate uh, right. handling. I think that was actually the reason why I didn't use it so now that you said that. <laughs> yeah, the, the script will become a bit more complex, but uh, what, why I'm asking you is because probably if you have, would have tried or would have detected or would have seen some stuff that we could uh, use to improve the model. Oh, okay. And just make it easier sure, to absolutely. this kind of uh, scenarios. Yeah. Well, it's something I'll look into because obviously I'm mean, very happy to try and use modules that people want to see improvement on or whatever. Um, so, and that's obviously, that's the whole SQL like module brand new, so. Yeah, uh, it was. Or DD engine. Yeah. yeah. And that uh, ACRD uh, is quite powerful. It, yeah, it makes it really, really convenient uh, so that you can have something that matches an 800 number, but then you can also explicitly say, well, if I'm calling this 800 number, have a higher priority rule so that this applies for this specific number, but for everything else, use these rules. Yeah. Um, so it's worked really well for me, um, but I'm definitely full of that. Yeah, it was just a question just to see if it can improve it or what, what, what was the decision? I, I think it was the having to do multiple specific yeah, things. There it is. Because uh, I've taken a look at the script here, uh -huh. and it's by the modular, and you, you have the entire translation in a single device. Yes, yeah. It's quite nice. We've tried very hard to to make the Back to the Federated SIP project as a reference implementation for OpenSIP. So we tried very hard to make it extremely clean and very modular. Uh, and that it does have IPv6 support, TLS, WebSocket support, 
all this stuff, but you can turn it off or on just by configuration parameters. And if you looked at the uh, at the actual repo, what the project actually is is it's basically a, an ERB templated open source config file, uh, and things are substituted in as a result of the ERB uh, interpolations. And all this stuff up here you can see is optional. Uh, WebSocket IPv6 support, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then, as Roslyn was saying, you know, we try to also uh, really modularize the code so that it's compartmentalized, you know, specific E164 blocks, outbound translation block is just this one block that does all the, the stripping stuff here. Local domain handling, which is registration logos, challenging requests is a single block. So that it, it's designed to be easy to digest uh, and easy to maintain. Uh, so I, I guess my last little bit here, so I'm coming up on 45 minutes, which is what I was supposed to be doing, uh, is that I would greatly appreciate people checking this out and using the project. Uh, very, very open to improving it, uh, adding more features, you know, uh, and it only gets better with more users uh, and more contributors. So. That's kind of my little personal plug for the project. Um, that's pretty much it then. Uh, thank you very much to the OpenSips team. Uh, obviously, it's a critical component of the project. <laughs> uh, thanks to Jared for his contributions to the Federated SIP uh, project. He's done a lot of refactoring and making things print nice logs, and things like that. And some of his commits for the OpenSips team have uh, been great for that. And like I said, Please try it out. The more uses, is better. Uh, you can contact me, send me an email, because they should work the same. Uh, Eric.tanydonson.com. That's it. I have another question. It's not it. Well, <laughs> why, not why, it. why did any particular reason you chose the uh, ERB for the complete script? Uh, yeah, honestly, yes. Uh, one, I'm familiar with Ruby, uh, and I've used it before. Uh, and two, we actually use ERB to manage our internal uh, configs at Onsen. Uh, and we deploy them by a git that way. So we use Puppet uh, to... Yeah, no, that was the hands price looking for. Yeah, to... So you do, uh, you do have it integrated with Puppet and... Yes. Okay. We use git remote hooks. Uh, anytime you do a push uh, to a specific branch, master, or whatever, actually we have different stacks, which is a whole different thing, but uh, it, it pushes out to a, a local repo in the box, and then Puppet runs a local factor stuff against it. Uh, and all the variables that are in the script just flush out, and that's it. The script builds and restarts, and that's it. Yeah, cool. Okay. Anything else? All right. Then we really are done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, please don't call 1000 on your phone later tonight. I don't want to. <laughs>
Exactly. Right. Right. But for 